me introduce myself again. Some of you are familiar from the previous session and, and others are new. Um, I'm Fantav and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Campus Life here at American and I also teach in uh, the School of International Service. I teach graduate courses in SIS. Um, and I'm going to have my colleagues introduce themselves and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what this panel will be covering. I'm Tracy Calandrillo. I'm the Director of our Counseling Center just down the hall. And hi, everybody. My name is Jimmy Ellis. I'm the manager of student success and retention, and I work in undergraduate studies. OK, so uh, this session is about who are our undergraduate students. Uh, we could have spent three hours on this topic, <laughs> uh, but we're going to spare you three hours of data and all of this good stuff. Um, and instead, really decided that for this specific round, we're going to focus on sort of three areas. And we picked those areas because these are trends that we have been observing for a period of time. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that these trends have taken on a different uh, form. And so we thought it would be probably appropriate for us to have the conversation. And so we'll be covering sort of three topics. One having to do with the class of 2018. Class of 2018 would really actually be the students who were admitted, who started this fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jimmy Ellis is going to talk to you about what we know about them uh, based on sort of survey data, focus groups, and all of that good stuff. Then uh, my colleague Tracy will talk to you about a trend um, that I think we've certainly seen for a while, but um, it's around mental health issues and our students. And then I will talk about a third one, which has to do with sorority and fraternity life. Um, and you will ask yourself, well, why are we talking about sorority and fraternity life? The short answer is that uh, sorority and fraternity life makes up about 21% of our student body. And it has been growing quite a bit over the last couple of years. So if you think about it, basically, we're talking about you know one out of what? Five students um, that belongs to sorority and fraternity life. And I, we want to give you a little bit more information about what that community is about and what we know about the community. And so we'll get started with Jimmy first. OK, yeah, so the class of 2018, our first year students, uh, just a little information about them. Wait a minute. There's logistics here we can figure out. If you have to like advance the slides. <laughs> this is behind the scenes at our presentation. We're letting you in. OK. So I'm going to draw from two sources of information here today. The first is a freshman census. The freshman census is a survey that we administer to all uh, incoming students during the first week of class that they're here. Or they take it right before they get here. So it's a snapshot of, uh, of who they are walking through the door. Uh, AU has not really infiltrated their psyche or their mentality yet. So it's, it's them and their past experiences. Uh, the next moment in time, which I have some information about, is our map work survey. And we administer that during the fourth and fifth week of classes. So they have been fully, uh, for better or for worse, affected by American University. And so let's see what those differences are and what, we, what we've learned this year. Um, before I get ahead of myself, I do want to say that uh, 2000, um, uh, fall 2014 was the, the, the end of a second wave, I would say, of a drastic change in our student population. From 2008 to 2009, we actually saw a pretty significant increase in the size of our first year cohort by about 300 students, from about 1,200 to 1,500 students. With that increase in size came uh, an increase in uh, academic preparation, so-called preparation with test scores and, and, uh, and GPAs coming in. So the quality, academic quality of our student really increased from that period. And then starting 2010 till about now, uh, we've seen uh, the underrepresented groups in our, in our population increase dramatically as well by about four or five times. So first generation students went from about two to 10%. Um, Pell eligible students went from under 10% to almost 20%. Um, underrepresented minority students, which we define as black, Hispanic, Latino, and Native American students, uh, also increased by about fourfold. So uh, we've had two waves of big time change, and this group's reflective of all that. So coming through the door, why do they select AU? Uh, the bars in gray are the reasons that the survey gives all students to, to answer. And those are our students' response to, 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 to those options. However, the ones in red are the ones that we put on the survey ourselves, invite students to give us their feedback on that too. And what we find is the, student, the options that we give students, that the AU-specific ones, are the ones that students pick the most often. And so AU is distinctive to them because of the opportunities that we afford them, and also the DC area is distinctive um, above all else. So there's that. I'll breeze through these, and we can come back to them if you have any questions. And, and we'll make sure we post this, this uh, PowerPoint to the Blackboard. That's right. 
And then uh, they want to engage with social issues. So coming through the door, uh, keeping up with political affairs, influencing social values, promoting racial understanding, which took on a big significance as the semester wore on. Again, this is walking through the door. So this is um, in August. And then we know that things really heated up around October, November, December during that period and becoming a community leader. Uh, on this chart, I give you comparison to our peer institutions. So we're the red bar in our peer institutions, which are institutions that are, are our selectivity. Uh, they're also private institutions uh, and about our size. Um, uh, you see the comparison there. I want to point out when you look at these graphs, uh, I think it's very easy to, to zero into those differences between the red and the gray bars. However, I'm interested in the, um, the, the empty space, the blank space. So the promoting the racial understanding, 54 is bigger than 38, and that's something that maybe pumps your fist about excitedly. But then there's a 46 that, that isn't saying, coming through the door, that that's something that they're really passionate about or interested about or want to know about. So um, look at that blank space in addition to the comparison that we have here. The next one is that the distinction that I talked about on the first slide, it comes with some challenges, and we'll talk more about that later. But we see that our students come in uh, having felt more overwhelmed, more stressed. Um, that they have less certainty when it comes to what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, and then we also see, and this was a part of another presentation, uh, they're more likely to be engaging on social media at an extent that is, might be too much and that, that might lead to some things. And I'll actually hold back a little bit on that because Tracy's going to talk a bunch about that. And then this is the last slide uh, about day one when they're walking through the door. Uh, they have high expectations around diversity. And so coming through the door, uh, they expect to socialize with people that are a different racial ethnic group than them. They expect to have a roommate of a different race and ethnicity. Um, it's, that's, you know, it's a huge difference. And then just like their peers across the country, uh, they um, think, they, they self-assess themselves to have a really good ability to get along with people of different race and cultures. And they can work with people from different race and cultures. So uh, they're highly confident coming through the door. Um, I, anyone teach cross-cultural communication in this class? In there? Okay, I just want to be, I, I talked to the cross-cultural communication instructors last week and they said, so students believe that they don't need our class, you know, coming through the door. And maybe that's why it, that class is hard to get some traction in the beginning because they are so confident. Um, briefly, I want to mention that this is also related to some other research we've done out of our office where students are likely to um, say that, uh, are more likely to, um, to, to be able to describe to you what they think other people expect of them yes. to, 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 be racial, to, be, to have racial understanding, to, to get along well with others. So they'll answer the question in this way. But in, in the way we designed our instrument, we got into, do you really feel that way? Um, and it's more important for them to express that they do than to actually do. Yeah. And I think that we saw that this tension, um, uh, that, that this uh, dis disconnect uh, played out as the semester wore on. So there's that. Um, now let's shift gears a little bit and then get into the fourth and fifth week of classes. I administer MapWorks, and MapWorks is a survey that we send to all new students, new first year transfer uh, students at AU. Uh, it has incredible participation. So on this survey that we send out, our first year students completed about 90% of the time. Uh, and so there's a lot of involvement in this survey. Um, and the purpose of this is not necessarily the research part of it, but we try to connect instantly with students that are demonstrating that they have some um, um, issues and we want to connect them to the resources. But as a byproduct of doing that, we get a lot of great information. Something to note about the perceptions of campus, this is the first year, so we've done MapWorks for four years now. The first three years, there was no movement on any of the trends. Um, it became to the point where I thought that that just needle didn't move and a lot of longitudinal type stuff. Change happens very slowly, so you don't see a lot of movement. But this was the first year where, uh, I mean, across the board, I was seeing five or 10 percent decreases in uh, student self-assessments of their experience. One that was particularly interest to me, interesting to me was this high overall satisfaction with institution and the high social integration. The satisfaction one talks about, would you choose AU again if you could? And would you recommend AU to others now that you've been here a while? And for the first time, we saw big drops in that. And that's an interesting one in that in this like happy four week, fifth week moment, we have only uh, you know, less than 50% that, that feel strongly about that. So that's a signal right there about what we're dealing with on campus. The high social integration is a question where we ask, um, do you belong here? Are you fitting in? Do people invite you to things? There's those kind of questions. And, and that also fell by quite a bit. These are big drops. Uh, and they're significant drops. We, we, we ran the stats on them, and, um, and it's not by chance that this happened this year. Is that unusual, or is that typical? Kind of, do you have data from prior years? That, yeah. You know, do you see that 
drop kind of normally? No, no. so uh, we don't expect issue. these numbers to change. Uh, yeah. the, the survey that I showed you previously is one we've done on campus for over 30 years, and the, and the trend lines on that are pretty flat. Yeah. And this was starting to be that way. I'm like, okay, well, there's nothing there. Well, this year, it's we had rough. big drops. And there's a lot of theories about that, and we'll probably get into some of that later on, but there were drops this year. Going on to the next slide, which was this computer. Um, on campus, you probably get a sense that uh, there, there's some tension and some worried about finances uh, at AU. And what I found in the data is that um, only about 44% of students are confident that they can afford monthly expenses and confident they can afford tuition and fees next semester. Um, that next semester is an important piece because a lot of students have a plan for one semester uh, or one year, but not necessarily the next semester or the next year, so that's something we're keeping an eye on. Um, not confident, so straight up not confident, was about 24%. So about a quarter of our students expressed being not confident that they can afford monthly expenses or afford tuition this next year. Um, again, you see a lot of certainty when it comes to major at AU. That's particularly an uh, interesting thing because um, there's a lot of stress around picking something and that being the thing you do to the very end. Uh, there's also a little bit of stress about not being undeclared or uncertain about your major because that's a signal for not being passionate about something. And AU is a passionate place, so if you don't know what you want to do, that could be something that, that comes up. So there's that. Um, our students expect to earn A's. We actually give about 50% A's, so their expectations are right online. Uh, so there, there's that. And then, and then the undergraduate degree is something they're just going to blow through. I mean, three quarters of them have aspirations for masters and, and beyond. So there's that. Um, and then here, I just want to point out uh, a couple things. 62% uh, of them believe they're uh, studying a sufficient amount, but I could tell you that 50% of them are studying less than 11 hours a week. a week. <laughs> so, <laughs> liars. <laughs> and, um, and about 16% of them are studying less than five hours, hours a, week. a week. Yeah, so I don't know what they believe. Uh, but it's not the right things. It's not the right <laughs> And that, that last one on there, the high advanced academic behaviors, uh, that fell by about 10 points. Uh, and in that is um, I participate in class, I communicate with instructors outside of class, and then this is related to our space issues, that there's a place that I could study and I could study on a regular schedule. Saw big drops in that as well. So the high basic academic behaviors is what? The high advanced academic behaviors? No, oh, the basic, basic. The basic's a 10 class. Um, turn in homework, take notes, you know, th those kind of things. They feel like they have those basics down. Um, and th that, that didn't change from one way or the other. That, 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 that stated about 80% from the previous year. But this is all people who've been here for four weeks. Yes. yes. Yeah, these are their self-assessments self at that point. Of yeah, yeah. Um, these have been really good signals for us. Uh, we've been able to take uh, these trends or, or these moments in time and then project out, you know, propensities to retain and return for the next term. And they've, they've served pretty pretty well in that capacity. So just to clarify, so I'm understanding, when you're yeah. saying it's gone down or gone up, that's over the last year, not yeah. over the entry point survey? Yeah, yes. great, great question. It's, it's a comparison. So it's cohort 2014 versus cohort 2013. Um, I will say this, that I, I have information from fall 13 uh, first year students going into their second year. They take MapWorks as well, and they're self-assessing themselves down. So there's a, there's a, depressing, a depressive kind of thing going on to our survey results that we hadn't seen previously. Um, and then here's the top five issues just generally. Homesickness is the biggest one. AU is far away from a lot of homes. Um, we don't have a home base, a home region, a home state. So that's one of the highest rates of homesickness that you'll see in the country uh, is at AU. Uh, test anxiety is 35%, and that's just feeling stress about tests, even if you feel like you're prepared, um, uh, not feeling like there's enough time to, to study, you know, that type of thing. And then um, there's, uh, you can look at the rest of them there. And I want to finish just with some things from the student perspective. Um, we also ask questions to students that are open-ended, and we want to get feedback about what they like least or what they like most. And what they like least has a lot of the common suspects. Um, uh, things about the facility, things about the food, things about their living situation, things about academics being too hard or too easy, and homesickness. That's always been there. This is the first year that I started seeing things around loneliness, isolation, and then a lack of a sense of belonging is the first time that I've noticed this. And these aren't going to be dramatic statements. I, I didn't want to get the ones that were very identifiable to people. These are just more general, but this is the tenor of some of these comments. You know, I feel I'm friendly with everyone, but friends with no one. I haven't seen stuff like that before in that what do you like least about AU. It's always been more about that thing. I don't like that thing. Um, and this was more about themselves, and that was really kind of a shock to see. Um, I miss home tremendously. This is a homesickness thing. 
I didn't think it bothered me so much, but you know, now I'd love to return home. This next one here is uh, feeling completely alone, being surrounded by everyone who knows what they want to be when I have no idea. You know, so that, that, that's, that's a big feeling in the room. I wish they would know that other people feel that way. I wish yeah. they could talk to them. Yeah, yes. exactly. And again, it's not surprising to read it, but it was surprising for me to see it because I had not seen it expressed before. Uh, I miss my family and community back home. And then this is intertwined with that. It's a major strain on my family's finances. So not my personal, but I'm worried about how my family's going to pay for this. And then people living together feel so disconnected. I come from a diverse school, and there are too many people here that I cannot relate with. It's hard to find people that are like me. Um, contrary to everything that we probably tell them uh, uh, you know, on the way in, uh, in the admissions process, about um, every, you know, diversity is embraced, you could find your place, everything else, they're really struggling. All right. And then there are days when you know, there's not anything going on campus or off. I'm like, you live in DC. You go to American. I look at Today at AU. I mean, that thing is overflowing, but there's that. All right, and then, uh, and this one is just sad. The sensation of loneliness can be quite intense at times, right? It's just uh, that, that we saw a lot of that. And then here's some sense of belonging stuff. Uh, the amount of people who shut you down because of your opinions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from a small town with a very diverse, open, and trusting environment. So the top three moments in my life in which I've been uncomfortable due to my racial identity have been on campus here the last yeah. few weeks. Mm -hmm. And again, when was this? It was, it was the fourth and fifth week of classes. Did that get better in October, November? I mean, no, I don't think so. So what about this student, you know, and, and, and that person's experience? Um, and here's a, it's something academically oriented. I love this one. It's uh, all this, right? It's like, it would be better to introduce us to the one major kids. And so <laughs> that's the one club we don't have on campus. It's the one major we club. Need, we need that club. Yes, we're going to form it. Uh, there's that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but the reality is, is that most students don't double major. You know, uh, th th that's the truth. But, yes. but the feeling the is that, that, that I am, I don't belong because I don't. Yeah, um, so the there's that. Uh, people are very judgmental, and I feel that I, that I tested way. Oh, this is academic uncertainty. Do they belong academically? Even though, hey, you tested that way. You know, you, you're, you're where you're supposed to be. You know, what is it about that classroom environment that makes them lose some of that confidence? Um, and then this one is that uh, this is something we've been seeing a little bit about that Republicans feel hated at AU. Yes. Oh, here you go. There's just some more of that. Um, and then this one right here, I, I, I put it in there because there are a lot of professors, instructors in the room, uh, and they're questioning your um, your authenticity about about caring about them. They're like, people focus on themselves. No one cares about me. The only people that do are professors, and they have to because I don't trust their intention. So that's an interesting one to read too. You know. Um, uh, do they belong here? Do the people that care about them really care about them? You know, where is that coming from? Where is those feelings emerging from? So that's my contribution. Uh, I'll leave it at that and, and, um, and then go and, from there. And now you'll know why, <laughs> what happens well, when those feelings are out there. We'll continue with the feel-good theme. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. There's one more. Oh. I, will, I will say now, just none of that came as a surprise to me. But then again, I don't necessarily the peop see the people who are like, I love it here. I'm doing great. I have no problems. They don't come to the counseling center. Um, Having said that, though, the, the two themes I want to weave into what we talk about today is student stress and mental health, because those are things all of our students have. They all experience stress, because academic life is stressful inherently, all life is, mm -hmm. and they all have mental health. But what I want to kind of put into perspective for you are some of the trends that we're seeing about how they're functioning around their mental health is really starting to take a shift. And these trends have been going on for many years. At AU, though, and we're going to look at some national data and some AU specific data, some of these trends are taking a really alarming turn. Mm -hmm. So, just to set the stage a little bit with some national data, and I don't have my reading glasses on, so I'm going to turn around to, to look at the numbers. Um, this, left, this left table is a look at uh, students who self reported that they had experienced, that, that they'd been diagnosed with depression. And so, if you look over the last 15 years or so, you'll see a steady trend upward in the number of students who come to a university nationally having been diagnosed with depression. And then this right, this right table is uh, counseling center directors across the country reporting the prevalence rates of depression and anxiety. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more at AU, but you'll see a shift 
from the highest type of diagnosis was always depression, that's shifted to anxiety. And that's very much true for us as well. So something has changed from students being depressed to students expressing their stress and mental health more as anxiety. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of head nods, so I'm guessing maybe you see that too. Okay, so this is, a, a, one table is national data, one table is, is data at American. Um, this is students, did I skip a slide? No, okay one is, is okay so this is students who have um, been in treatment previously and students at AU have been in treatment previously so the national data um, you can see that about half of the students had never been in any kind of treatment it's a little bit less at AU and we can speculate about that frankly I think probably one reason is our students probably had some more economic resources that they could pursue mental health treatment if they needed it um, but significant amounts of, of our students have had mental health issues before they've come to school. Um, this this uh, number at the top, I think, is notable because if 46% of individuals who have been diagnosed with depression <coughs> have a relapse, if that experience happened in high school, what are we seeing for them in college? Mm -hmm. When they're in a more stressful environment and they don't necessarily have the family support system around them, them, around them to support them through the relapse. Okay. So this is the same kind of information, but about medication. So um, they're not statistically significant, probably, but you'll see that our students have a somewhat less likelihood of having taken medication prior to coming to college. But we're still talking about a pretty significant part of the population who's been at a point where their functioning was so low that they needed to use medication. Okay. It also says something about the resources that are expected and needed when students come to college. Do we know what they mean by medication? Psychotropic medication. So medication for a mental health concern. Most commonly, that's going to be a medication for uh, depression or anxiety. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a slide that gives you some information about the um, kinds of distress. And this is some of it is a little bit different than what we see mm -hmm. in, in your data. But um, I want to point out for sure this this uh, column over here on the left, and so the dark blue is national data. This is the National College Health Assessment. The lighter blue is at American, okay? So this item is the, num the percentage of students who said that they were so overwhelmed that they couldn't function in the last year. So nationally, that's 85%. At American, it's over 91%. Of our students say that at some point in the last year, they've been so overwhelmed that they can't function. Mm -hmm. So when we think about stress and we think about distress, so if you think about those as a continuum, we have a very high number or very high percentage of students who are saying, I'm overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. I can't do all that I do. And I go back to that place of the perception of I have to have eight majors and mm -hmm. this many internships and et cetera, et cetera. There's something going on there in terms of the messages that they're getting and their belief about what they're supposed to be doing, I think. Um, other notable, now these kind of go with the themes of depression and anxiety, but a pretty high number of our students have expressed being very sad over the last year, and we're about with the national average for anxiety and hopelessness. Okay, so um, some of you may be wondering, why does the Counseling Center, why do I have a hard time getting my students there? Okay. Um, I wanted to just give you a snapshot of some data about what we've done in the Counseling Center in the last year, and then look a little bit at, because you know, with the type of class that we enrolled for the first year class, we wondered, are, the, are we going to see a difference in percentage of first year students coming into the Counseling Center? So in the fall semester, we conducted 531 initial appointments. Those are the kind of appointments that you need to start being seen in the Counseling Center. 1,784 ongoing counseling sessions. Uh, 284, we have an urgent care system where students can drop in to see us. So you don't have to have an appointment. Um, I will say, because that's a pretty alarming increase, we started the drop-in system last year. So it's a pretty significant increase, but also I think we, the word wasn't out quite as much as it is now. So it's a very healthy uh, increase there. Um, it was like a 500% increase for the month of September, though, so that was a little overwhelming for us, Jane. And the 26% of all urgent care walk-ins were first-year first students. 26% of first-year students. No. No. Mm -hmm. Then we'd really be having okay. a... I just don't know. <laughs> that would be bad. So 26% of the... 26% 24. of this, right. So about the same of what I guess we'd expect to see statistically in terms of the 
amount of students in each class. Yeah. The last one, I think, uh, what I, I want to give a little bit of context. So um, just so that everyone understands the threshold, we rarely send students to the hospital. That comes up when, it, when we've determined clinically that the person isn't going to be safe. Um, either they're, they have thoughts of harming themselves or they have thoughts of harming other people. That comes up very frequently. Most of the time, we don't send those students to the hospital. Um, when we do send a student to the hospital, it's because we believe they just really need to be in an inpatient setting. So last year, we transported three people to the hospital in the fall semester. This year, we transported 17. And of those 17 people, 16 were admitted, yeah. which means that the medical staff at the hospital agreed that the person was not at a place that they could be safe. So they warranted being in the hospital. Um, we can talk more about what, that's, what that all means, but that's kind of a snapshot of what and kinds of activities. Can I ask yeah. a quick question sure. about that stat? Um, what was the increase in numbers of freshmen between 2013 and 2015? Yeah, it, it was um, almost, it was like between 280 or 300. 300, yeah. close to 300. Close to 300. New students. 300 increase? Additional yeah. increase. 300 more students than the previous year. Yeah. What percentage is that? Um, about a 10, 10, oh, 10%. 10, 15, 10, yeah, I, I, let me look at my, here, I'll get, I'll get right back to but you, yeah, extend your point. Try to put that in context. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, with the increase, there's obviously an increase in, in numbers of people, which, you know, could correlate that, but then there's the increase, as we've talked about, of right. schools and right. just not having the Right, space. the ambient experience of that, having that many more humans that need all the things they need when they come to a university. So how does this show up on campus? Here are some examples, and many of these are the kinds of things that you might see in the classroom. So when students aren't at a place where they're managing and regulating their stress well, it's hard for them to go into the classroom and perform the way we want them to. It's hard for them to stay focused and have the bandwidth to study and take care of themselves. Um, that anxiety shift that we saw, where that's one of the more prevalent kinds of concerns, can lead to panic attacks over class assignments not getting done. Um, needing to take medication and therefore needing more resources to take care of yourself. Um, needing to reduce your course load because you can't handle a full-time load. These are some of the kinds of things that we, we see as impacts. Now, many of our students get uh, resources in the counseling center and don't have these kinds of, of more uh, sort of distress type concerns. And then just to say a little bit, if you don't know what the services are on the, counseling, on, on the university um, campus for students in distress, the Counseling Center offers talk therapy. We do individual and group therapy, a lot of crisis management. We have urgent care walk-in, drop-in hours every day from 3 to 5. You don't need to wait until then, although that's the time when we have staff set aside to be able to see students in, in distress. Um, we do a lot of consultations, so you can always call us to talk about a situation. Um, of course, if it's confidential, because we're working with the person, we can't tell you that, but we'll be glad to talk with you about it. And then we do quite a bit of off-campus referrals for students who want to be seen longer than we can see them in the counseling center. Okay? The health center offers psychiatric services and medication management, which if you think about the number of people who come here needing that, um, it's really helpful that they can get that on campus. And then the academic support and access center provides a lot of interventions that can help around the academic-related stress. And then lastly, uh, does anyone not know what the CARE Network is? Okay, so on our campus, the Dean of Students Office has a um, way of giving just information that you're concerned about a student, and we can talk after if I can give you more information about that. Um, I don't see on your list there um, that you do makeup exams, like, so where does... Um, Accommodations. Accommodations. Kind of, mm -hmm. That happens through the Academic Support and Access Center. So if a student needs accommodations for any kind of academic situation, they usually start with that office, although they get referrals from all over campus. But the accommodations part usually comes with the person who has a, is registered with a disability. Right, because I, I had a student that needed a makeup exam because mm -hmm. they were sick the day of the, I think it was the final actually. Mm -hmm. And we tried doing calling, she tried, I. No one wanted to give, give okay. a makeup exam. Okay, right? that's a different, that's a different issue. Um, the Academic Support and Access Center deals with students who need specific testing environment right. because of disability, et cetera. A makeup exam, that is not the purview within the Academic Support Center right. um, for a makeup exam if it's not related to a, a specific academic so issue. Who, 
That's a basic thing that happens all the time. That, that is left to the professor to negotiate with the student. That's a professor, student. The final though, the semester's over. I go to, I have a job. Um, it's sort of hard to do. Uh, why don't you so, do that or somebody? Well, well I, is probably not the best place for them. For that, yeah. Now, I would suggest that's a conversation with the associate dean of that respective mm -hmm. school, but that's not within the purview of the academic support center. Yeah. yeah. And you would, I mean, we didn't give you the statistics here of how much accommodation testing is actually done. And I can, as, I can assure you that the stress that that puts in terms of just number of days and time and hours is just staggering. It's absolutely staggering. So I cannot imagine the Academic Support Center taking up makeup exams for students. That, that just would not. They're sitting behind you and shaking their yes. head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that just. Can you briefly, yeah. um, uh, when I've had students with mental health concerns, I've gone through the CARE network. Yeah. But I didn't know about this consultation with faculty. With, in what circumstances might I use consultation with Counseling Center versus the mm -hmm. CARE network? Mm -hmm. I would say that it's always the best default is the care network. Yeah. Um, one of the things that the counseling center, you know, it's hard for us to, because of the confidential nature of what we do, we can't leave our office. And so we're kind of not the most effective resource if you want somebody to make something happen after you've alerted. Um, if you want to talk through, what do you think this is? Or oh, yeah. what are your is thoughts about how I, could, yeah, yeah. how I could talk to my student or... I'm concerned and I need them to come to you. Well, first of all, just walk them over to us if you can. But that would, it's more we are just here for you if you want to kind of walk through something. Yeah. Okay. So, so we're going to shift gear a little bit. Um, I mean, Jimmy reported from MapWorks and the campus census data some of sort of the, the, the challenges that our students, particularly first year students coming in, feel at the beginning of their semester the sense of isolation, not feeling that they're necessarily connected. Um, and then um, Tracy has given you some of the data about some of the mental health issues and the trends there. Um, I'm going to focus on actually a different uh, segment, and that is the segment that actually has a sense of belonging um, on American University campus and reports consistently that they feel that they have a very strong sense of belonging at American University because they've been able to find a community, and that's fraternity and sorority life. Um, and there are a couple of things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, one is I'm going to go straight to the data about, uh, yes, okay. So basically, based on last spring data, um, spring of 2014, we had about 1,383 members, um, students who belong to sorority and fraternity life. And out of that group, it's, as I said before, it's 21% of the undergraduate student population um, that belongs to, that, uh, to sorority and fraternity life. And I've listed you know, uh, the different affiliation. We have 14 with IFC, NPHC3, et cetera. Those are all listed here. And again, you're going to have the slides. Uh, that are there. The other thing as well is you will notice that out of that group, 104 have a 4.0 um, among that population, and 268 of them studied abroad. Next is, are the councils and chapters, um, because they're organized within council and chapters, and this lists the different sorority and fraternity groups that are recognized here on AU campus. Just to give you some information, um, as a campus, we have not, um, you know, we've there's a real process for actually bringing on a new group to campus. And over the years, we've really not increased those numbers in terms of bringing in new chapters or new groups to campus. Um, that's been a conversation that's been ongoing with our sorority and fraternity life um, students. There's been a lot of interest and a lot of appetite for more groups to come to campus. Um, but we manage that, manage a protocol of how many and so forth over this period of time. But I can assure you that there's probably not a single semester that goes by where I don't get a request from several groups saying we are ready to bring another group to campus. The data comparison between our sorority and fraternity life and our student body, I wanted to give you that information. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that 29% of degree-seeking students, 29% um, of our students um, that are degree-seeking are students of color, and you'll notice that 26.9% of students who belong to sorority and fraternity life are students of color. The reason I bring this up is really to give you a sense that, interesting enough, our sorority and fraternity life tends to mirror quite a bit what our student body is on campus, because I think a lot of times there's this perception that probably the vast majority of them, you know, that our students of color don't participate at all. And the other thing as well is that don't assume that their participation are with the NPHC. As a matter of fact, those numbers continue to decline 
exponentially and we're actually seeing them being more involved with more of uh, with the other groups as well so that's one of the data points the other thing as well is that you'll look at the retention rate our retention rates for sorority and fraternity life is significantly higher than our retention rate for our general student population and I can give you a lot of reasons why that is, but a big part of it has to do with the network that they're able to build, and more importantly, their real sense of belonging as a community, and the level of support that they're able to provide to each other, and also they're very resourceful at accessing the resources that are available, because there's that support network that's available. So for sorority and fraternity life, the first year retention rate is 90%, I mean, it's 90% for campus, but for sorority and fraternity life, it's 95%. Okay, and then you see that the retention rate over the period of time, four-year retention rate, there's big difference there, huge difference in terms of our students are more likely to stay with us in their participation in that, um, in, in that way than, than some of our other students. Then the other thing has to do with grade point average, academic performance. Um, the, you'll notice that the average GPA for our undergraduate students um, is 3.15. The average GPA for our sorority and fraternity life is 3.35. Um, so again, in terms of academic performance, uh, strong academic performance. Um, many times people are not aware of the eligibility requirements for how you actually, a student gets into fraternity or sorority life. And what I can say to you is that they're not eligible until they've completed um, 12 credit hours at American. They need to have been here for at least a semester before they can actually belong to sor sorority or fraternity life. Um, the other thing as well is that they have to have a minimum GPA requirement. The reality of it is many of them, most of them have GPAs that are significantly above the minimum requirement that's listed here. Um, also, there, I've listed events and programs, et cetera. Um, what I really wanted to talk to you about, and I want to spend a little bit more time on, are really a couple of things that we have observed over this period of time. Um, I know that in the spring of 2014, there was a lot of headlines. You got a lot of emails and memos about an underground group that was not a group that was recognized by the university um, for all the reasons that you can imagine why it was not a recognized group by the university. Uh, but the thing that I really wanted to bring up to this audience is that we hear a lot from our sorority and fraternity life that AU is not exactly a welcoming place for sorority and fraternity life, that there are lots of misconceptions about what sorority and fraternity life is about. Um, and I know our students often will say to me and to others, whatever you can do to help us really, in many ways, um, help portray the sorority and fraternity life that we are part of, that would be extremely important to us. And among the issues that have come up, particularly uh, in terms of sorority and fraternity life, has been um, the fact is that we do not have housing for sorority and fraternity life on campus. We haven't had housing for a very long time. Um, our, the majority of our students who belong to sorority and fraternity life actually live in residence halls. And then those who do not live in the residence hall do live in houses. Um, and that has certainly been one of the challenges. Uh, the, the those who are living in houses, we probably get some, depending on the time of year, I think Tracy and I can say, depending on the time of year, usually the beginning of the semester. Um, there's lots of reports of neighbor issues, um, noise, complaints, you name it. And living in the neighborhood that we're living in, um, I can tell you, the, for those who are involved in neighbor relations, it is not fun um, to be dealing with the number of issues that we deal with with our neighbors and the housing situation there. Another issue also that I have seen come up tremendously, particularly because several of us are on our emergency call um, at the beginning of the semester has to do with alcohol transport. The number, we didn't put the data here, but I can assure you that the number of alcohol transport between this past year and 2013 is just, is just um, it, it's been out of control is probably the best way for me to frame this. Um, so this issue of alcohol transport and alcohol consumption and off-campus quote-unquote parties has been certainly one of the biggest concerns that I think we've had. Alcohol transport means what? Well, alcohol transport means basically that um, a student drank to the point that literally they were either passed out, they were really in a state that, that really required probably medical attention, and therefore we had to transport them to a hospital. <laughs> Um, and generally, it meant, it meant transporting them to the emergency room is exactly what we had to do. And Fanda, you're saying within the fraternity sorority the, community, that's fine. The, well, here's the thing. The, the, the interesting thing about that is that the parties are happening in those homes. Okay. So the consumption is not simply by sorority and fraternity life. Actually, the consumption is from all over the board. But where they're actually consuming 
alcohol tends to be in those spaces. And that's been one of the biggest challenges that we've had, particularly um, with, with uh, some of the housing, off-campus housing. Yeah. You mentioned that most of the Greek life was in the residence halls. Do they have a, a floor or area or nothing? Or no, we don't have, for example, floors that are designated as sorority or fraternity life floors. Um, they're spread out. The truth of the matter is that students, after they've been here for a year, can opt who their roommates will be. So over a period of time, you'll see students congregate and cluster based on the, uh, you know, the kind of the opting that they've done. Uh, but there's not a floor or a building that's been designated specifically for sorority and fraternity life. So I would say one of the challenges certainly has been around um, this perception of, of, of parties, of campus parties, and particularly the, the, the perception and the issues, and not perception in some cases, of really the alcohol consumption um, that, that has happened. Um, the ways we've tried to address many of these issues has been really peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Um, we have found a lot of research has indicated that the peer-to-peer -peer accountability is really something that needs to be emphasized and re-emphasized in every way possible. And so we've been working really, really hard with the leadership of, you know, of IFC and others to really hold their peers accountable. So examples of peer accountability is that um, first year students are not allowed to attend parties that are happening off campus as first year students. So that's one example of peer accountability that we're trying to implement as well. Um, the other thing as well that I think often happens is that all of our sorority and fraternity life at the beginning of welcome week have to register uh, their parties so that we know where the parties are taking place. And also, all sorority and fraternity life housing, um, we have the information about where our sorority and fraternity life students live and so forth, so that when we have incidents, we know who are actually living in those homes and so forth. So those are some of the things that we've put in place. Last fall, um, I brought in a team to do an external review of the health and welfare of our sorority and fraternity life so that we could get a sense of where are things going in the right direction, where are things that we need to be paying much more attention to. Um, as we expected from it, one of the things that they raised was really how critical it is to those students to have a sense of belonging and how fraternity and sorority life really does provide that. But the same token, they also were able to, in many ways, reemphasize for us that there's some very high risk behavior issues that really have, we have to grapple with um, as a community and that we have, to, we have to work on. What I think is critical for the faculty to really understand and, and, and hear as well is that we are starting rush period and we really, really need all eyes and ears. Um, hazing is something that we take very, very, very seriously. And we really need faculty uh, to start paying attention because we're starting the hazing, we're starting the, not the hazing period. <laughs> it will probably start as well. We're not, we're not going there, but yeah, it could probably start as well. We're starting the rush period. And some of the things that really can become sort of triggers for faculty to kind of pay attention to are really the students who begin talking about the fact that they're having sleep, they're sleep deprived because they're going through rush and there's just, I mean, just heavy emphasis on behaviors and other things that really, I think in many ways, stress them out are things that we're seeing. Students who are, be, who are absent from classes because they're, being so, they're so busy trying to take care of what they call other things. Um, those types of things, I think, become really important for us to pay attention to. So we really are asking you to report anything that you're not sure about and you're seeing behavior changes with students to really help us by putting things on the care network and then we will basically follow up with students to see what's going on there. Yep, Jane. What is the period? I mean, I know there's some stuff over It is exactly, sta uh, the, sorry. There's some stuff over MLK weekend, but how, how long does it last? Uh, the period is literally the first three weeks, I think. It goes on for a while. Okay. Because we have so many different groups, and it, but it goes on for a while. The pledge period. The pledge period. It, the pledge period is longer than that. Okay. Yes. So it really, it's gonna, it, it really will hit, hit us as soon as we get started with MLK weekend. So really, literally the weekend of the 19th. That's when we get started. Yep. Um, I'm a bit confused. All of the um, slides before talked about the original stats were talking about people feeling isolation, loneliness, mm -hmm. you know, the numbers of people increase. And the counter to that is the nature of community. Mm -hmm. which the Greek system seems to be able to counter. Mm -hmm. On campus, where the students are living in the resident hall, mm -hmm. you have that kind of disillusion of the Greek presence of community because they're all mixed in mm -hmm. on different floors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because that would seem counter to developing 
for community relationships, for where people are actually belonging to a fraternity or a sorority, and there are so many designated floors, you know, I'm... So, so there are a couple of things. One is that, um, one of the things we didn't raise here, but that we have been doing as well, is that we do have learning communities at American University, and actually we've increased those numbers quite a bit to help build a sense of community and not just intellectual, but social community. So that's one of the ways we're really going about this disconnect about the sense of belonging. And we're doing that particularly with first year students. So we have really increased the number of learning communities where actually students are living together on the same, uh, on the same floor, but also are taking some courses jointly, whether it's university college, whether it's the community-based you know, scholars program and others. So we have that in the mix. The data indicates that for those students who are in communities, their retention rate is quite high. Mm -hmm. And also their satisfaction rate with the university overall and feeling like they're connected so to someone is high. Now, with that being high, it doesn't mean that there's not mental health issues. <laughs> let, me, let, me just, yeah. let me just put that in a box. That doesn't mean that those students are not, you know, have less mental health issues or any of those issues. They're still, those issues I think are still very much there and Tracy can speak much more about that. Going back to sorority and fraternity life, um, there, were, there are a couple of things. One is that, um, and, it, and you're raising a really important point. The students, it's clear that if, if our sorority and fraternity life had an option, they would like to see housing for sorority and fraternity life. Our housing inventory is very challenging. It is extremely challenging for the size of student body that we have and the housing options that we have. Especially because with our housing, we have to look at how do we house first year students? How do we house the learning communities that are part of that mix? How do we house also upper class students by having Nebraska Hall just for upper class students, et cetera? So it's been really challenging to try to create that kind of environment within our housing structure. Now, with that said, who knows? Once East Campus is built and we have more housing inventory, things may change at that time. But it is true that our sorority and fraternity life have said that that has been a challenge for them because not having on-campus housing for sorority and fraternity life, a lot of their socializing happens in those homes off campus. And that is an issue. That is, that is an issue that you've raised. If I can just add something real quick. So in, with us growing our learning community population by so much, um, it's about half of our students that are not a part of one of those now. Yeah. And so there becomes a distinct other AU experience yes. that I think you're comp that a student will compare their experience to. Yeah. And so I think that causes some problem. And even within the communities, there is some tension about which one is better than the other. Yes. And so even though yeah. you're involved in it, the, yeah. the, the, there's some of that that's so going it's a, it's on too. Issue. So there's always problems that happen. Yeah. Um, and then in the first year, just as a point of, of uh, clarity, uh, our first year students, you know, aren't a part of uh, sorority fraternity life in that first semester. Not. And so the, the, there's not an intermix, uh, intermix of fraternity life and, and and first year students in that first term when we collect a lot of the uh, of my data. But then starting in the spring term, that's when we see a lot of um, the intermingling. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Oh, sorry. First year. First year. Half of first, half of first year students are recent. not part of learning, are not part of community learning communities. Yeah, it's the first time it's been that way. That's yeah. about about fifty fifty at this point, and yeah. um, and something we're trying to grapple. And then back to your point about what's the percent increase. We went from sixteen twenty eight in our first year cohort to seventeen eighty eight. So it's a ten percent increase, about one hundred sixty students. Yeah. So that was that, that's the increase. So yeah, questions, comments, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so the rogue organization in <laughs> the rogue organization in question, um, the the challenges are the following: because it is not a recognized group, um, the the key part of it is that as a group, it cannot have any operation on campus. And one of the things that has been the most challenging, going back to peer to peer accountability is the fact that in order for us to know what's going on behind the scenes, we need to have students who are willing to report what they're seeing. Students are very, very unwilling to do that. As a matter of fact, when we had the incidents that we, des that we described in the spring, and we started to bring people to conduct council one after the other, one after the other, and so forth, the the backlash that we received were from other students. And these were students who were not even affiliated with those groups. But students who said, 
But that person is, a, is an incredible person. That's a friend of mine. That's a really good person. And I can't believe that you're accusing them of A, B, C, D, and so forth. So one of the things that we're really finding more and more as a challenge overall, so this group is still not recognized. This group, if we find out from anyone that there's anyone on campus that's, it, that's involving things that really are problematic, the police has been involved. There's been lots of different folks who've been involved. And, there's been, and some folks have been dismissed based on findings and et cetera. But really, in order for us to be able to act, we need people to be able to report those things. And we are finding that more and more, you can name the issue, our students are very reluctant to turn in their peers in whatever form. I mean, we have an anonymous hazing form that has now been posted, hoping that that will help because students don't have to necessarily come and say who they are, et cetera, and so forth. But even in those instances, we're finding that it is really hard to get our students to, in many ways, speak up to those issues. So that's, that's really problematic. Yep. Yeah. I'm concerned. I had such an amazing undergraduate experience. Yeah. I just don't feel like they're having fun and yeah. they're stressed. And I do my best to tell them it's going to be OK. And you don't have to have 12 internships. And I try to make my classes fun. And But what else can I be doing to make them feel better? That's a great question. And thanks for asking it. Um, so one of the initiatives that we're working on um, to try to get at that stress piece, because again, I think 91% of them are overwhelmed, and they're talking to you about that. Um, and so there's a working group right now. Jimmy's actually part of that group with me. And we're trying to look at the piece around stress and what to do as, a, as an institution to tackle some of that. And I will tell you, I think probably one of the most powerful things you can do is talk about how you manage stress and to acknowledge that you feel it and that we all feel pressure that we're supposed to perform in a certain way mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, think about, and I, I'm not knocking it, but what's on the side of our bus? How do we represent ourselves yeah. as an institution? Yeah. It's very powerful. Yeah. It's really exciting. But when you're an individual and you think about the comments that some of the students mentioned, yeah. the social comparison that goes into that, everybody looks better than you if you're, if you're looking inside yourself mm -hmm. because you're looking at their outsides. Mm -hmm. So, and I know that sounds kind of, mental healthy, but no, I guess but it's I'm true. a psychologist. <laughs> no, no, um, so that's the piece I would say to you yeah. is using your own experience and really just normalizing for them, yeah, college is stressful. And pace yourself. You know, you want to be sustainable in what you do, not I'm going to do it all this semester, I'm going to do it all in four years. And, and the other thing also that we're finding as a trend that we didn't talk about, but we're beginning to track as well, is that we're seeing more and more of the students who are coming here who really want to get out of here in three years. Mm -hmm. um, those numbers are really have gone up. I, I, I had you know, the registrar run for me sort of some data on the number of students who are finishing in three years as opposed to four. Some of that is really driven by cost. I mean, the students have been very vocal about the fact that cost is a real, real, is a reality for them on many level. Mm -hmm. And even when they, they get their financial aid package and these things, you know, they're, they're like, OK, it's OK for now. But it's always a constant. It may be OK for this semester, but what about next semester and the following semester, et cetera? So with that as well, I think because they're looking at a three-year plan and because in many ways we have really, I think I often say to my admission colleague, we've done an incredible job with marketing mm -hmm. over the years. And we have students who are coming here who, for whom this idea of I should be doing two majors, I should be doing internship as many as I need to, and I should be the, the president of my club and organization, and I should be doing community work in the community, and then by the way, oh, because I'm here, I need to have two jobs. And I need to finish in three years. And I need to finish in three years. I mean, it's just, it's a pressure cooker. Um, do you have data getting at the um, financial uh, aspects? Do you have data on um, family income for yeah. the students that come here and the demographics of students? Are you going to show that? Uh, we have that data and we can put it on the slides. We have that data and we can put it on the slides that we're going to post and you can access that data there. Um, what we can tell you is, is certainly the following. One is that, um, believe it or not, for the, for the entering first year class, the average family income was $146,000. Okay, that's the average. Now, now, <laughs> and this is where the issue is. With that said, when you look at our entering freshman class, we had about what, 17% that were Pell eligible? Yes. Right. Out of that. Mm -hmm. 
Basically, Pell eligible students are students whose family contribution is now more than $5,000 toward the cost of an education that's uh, close to $60,000. So they need to be absolutely packaged to the maximum for them to be able to come to AU in order to be able to afford AU. The other data that we have as well, 80% of entering first year students applied for financial aid, 80%. Out of that lot, 70% actually completed the full application mm -hmm. for financial aid. We also know that there's 25% of students who never filled out a FAFSA. They're not filling out a FAFSA because they have zero need or because they're an international student and they're not eligible to fill out FAFSA. So there are some socioeconomic disparities that are very pronounced on our campus over this period of time when it comes to the financial aid packaging and when it comes to financial aid. The same way that the university over this period of time has increased the uh, portion of financial aid every single year. I think it was what, 20, what was it, 17 million? Um, what is it? 29 million. 29 million dollars. On the incoming class. On the incoming class was spent on financial aid. So we continue to increase the financial aid but also as the cost increases, and what happens is also while students are here, because I spend a lot of time on those financial aid issues, what we're finding is that while the students are here, their family situation changes, i.e., and this is something that happens, a divorce happens, and maybe one of them got a settlement, and the, the student is a dependent, that's considered an income. Right. And so that immediately affects what happens the following year, et cetera. Or in some cases, students have gotten private loans to be able to come to supplement, but then now that they've increased their loan, more and more banks now are denying those loans because they're becoming more high risk. So they may come in year one with that loan package, but then by year two, that loan gets denied, and then it's trying to figure out what happens. So those are some of the elements that we're certainly seeing on the financial aid uh, side of things. You know, I, I haven't done direct data comparison to look at that. I can tell you anecdotally from what I see in the counseling center, that social comparison piece really plays out, a sense of I don't belong here. Um, whether that's true or not, that's the belief, is all the students around me are coming from this financial place that I'm not part of, and so I don't belong. So did that, that loneliness stuff you were yeah. talking about? Yeah. I'm guessing those are related. Yeah, yeah. I actually was, I was hoping for this, th th yeah. this big observation, but there wasn't. It was across the board. It was pretty oh. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, However, I will say that what I saw in the actual numbers uh, was that uh, self-assessments of your ability to do well and your academic skills and all that, that was pretty even. But then uh, self-assessments of belonging, um, fitting in, uh, that there's people here that I like, uh, people here that invite me to things. That was, um, it went the way that you expected, where um, uh, um, first generation status, underrepresented minority uh, status, there was a slight uh, decrease uh, when we look at, to, at the majority populations in those groups. Yep. Gihan and then Mihala. Yes. First of all, just thanks so much. This is fascinating mm -hmm. and really important, I think, for all of us to know. Um, what are your speculations beyond like increasing first year class yeah. size, right? Um, as to or maybe you have better than speculation um, on what's causing these particularly yeah. the negative trends you know, that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll start with the biggest picture. Uh, I think that the national conversation about what education is and and um, the value of it, the yeah. um, uh, like what it's. I, I think it's it's really it's um, you know how like a uh, a puppy can feel the tension from the owner on the leash. I, I think that that's sort of what it is. I think our students are feeling that yeah. tension yeah. both from their parents, from their communities, from the national conversation. So I think they come in amped up a little bit um, for that. Uh, I think the cost is a big issue as well, more so than the size constraint. Uh, students will repeatedly tell me that I know how much things cost me by the minute in a classroom. You know, so if, if things aren't productive or if someone is occupying a lot of time and space that is it moving the conversation along, they feel cheated. Uh, and so there's that. And is that different from last year? So I would say there are a couple of uh, things that are, a bit, that are a bit different from last year yeah. in terms of beyond the size. Um, a couple of things that come up. One is that we saw quite a bit of increase with our Latino student population from last year to this year. Actually, there was quite a bump in those numbers. 
Also, the other area that we saw really quite a, I mean, a significant uh, change as well was the geographic representation. Okay, the fact that we have more students coming from California than even the previous year, the fact that we have more students coming from the South than in previous years, etc. This this issue of distance and being far from home is big. The other element of it has to do with some of the cultural dimensions of it, and particularly family. We hear particularly from a lot of our students who are coming from that part of the country that really the issue of family is really important. And in coming to a place like American, really finding that sense of family, of surrogate family, becomes really pronounced. That's a difference that we've seen. The other thing that we're also seeing as a difference is that we're finding that, how to best phrase this? I, I, I keep saying that we have had the housing bubble, and I think we're now seeing the educational bubble. We have more and more students that I'm spending time with, having conversation with about, can they really afford an education at AU? And whereby, by hook or by crook, the families are gonna do whatever it takes to get that education at AU. And what we have found is that there's no financial plan. Mm -hmm. It is a one semester financial plan. And so what I have been labeling this phenomenon is the hope and prayer students. We have more hope and prayer students than I've ever seen in the time that I've been at American, simply because there's this sense that if you come to AU, you are going to increase your social and political capital. I mean, our students believe this to no end, and their parents believe it. And so as a result, I'm seeing more students who are willing to take out these big loans, in a way, even just in this past year than even previously. And I think with that comes additional stress, with that come additional sense of obligation to family to perform, to do well, to finish quickly, to make sure that that investment has been really well spent. And that, I think, in just in the last year has been more pronounced, to be honest with you again. It's tipping. It's really tipping. Yeah. You know, I think you, uh, what you said about the geography is also really an important point, because we have this, again, there's this big tension that, they're, yeah. you know, they're, yes. we advertise, and they're saying that they're yeah. coming to DC because yes. to AU because of DC. Absolutely. And internships and all of this. And the, at the same time, you have the draw yeah. of homesickness and, yeah. like, Mm -hmm. connection to family and they're all very far away yep. and finances and all of that. So it's a, it's a real tension point, you know, and, and it's been also hard because, you know, people have said, well, you know, how much of these conversations are we having with students? And I can tell you that in conversation with students, their families are really sensitive to this issue of cost. Mm -hmm. And especially how dare you tell us that maybe we should think of, of another option. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, is so, so it's, you know, so it's something I think we all need to be paying much more attention to in terms of how we're working with students around sort of the stress factor, um, their need for a sense of belonging, um, as well as you know, things that we need to be paying attention to in terms of what creates a sense of community for the students while they're here knowing that that's gonna be probably the trend moving forward. Because that's the other thing, I mean, that's, you know, when you look at in terms of nationally, what will be the pipeline for high school students coming to university, this is what it's gonna look like. Yeah. So we're out of time, we're, and we want to make sure you get to your next program on time. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we'll make sure we add the financial aid information before we post it. And certainly feel free to get in touch with either Tracy, Jamie, or myself if you have any additional questions uh, that we can help with. Thanks again. Thank you.